Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, everybody. Um, so um, the perfect end to a perfect day. The sun came out. We have Stephen Lambert and a party at Club C21. It doesn't get much better than that. Um, thank you for coming, uh, particularly when, when the sun's out. Just a few words about um, uh, Stephen before we uh, get into a conversation. Uh, he, he is one of the most prolific uh, producers in the business. He started his career at the BBC as a researcher. He worked in the factual department there for many years uh, before joining RDF. Uh, and, and that was when the, the shows started, started to arrive, shows like Faking It, uh, which really kicked things off. He left uh, that company, I think, five years ago? Uh, and launched uh, Studio Lambert. And Studio Lambert, uh, as part of the All3 Media Group, has defined itself as a production company that has really managed to work well, particularly in America. And most recently, uh, as part of uh, the, the group's uh, expansion into that area, All3 America was launched with Stephen at the helm. So I think before we get into a conversation about uh, his thoughts on the format business, maybe we can start with some perspective on what uh, um, all three America is all about. So perhaps we can see that reel now, please. for this company. I know exactly what it takes to run a restaurant like this. And guess what? I know the right way to do it, and I know the wrong way to do it. And what I saw here today is completely the wrong way to do it. Right here, right now, we're gonna shut the restaurant down. Dressed as Nawab Zada, Sultan Salauddin Khan Babi of Balasenor. <laughs> you have a mortgage? We do have a mortgage. What's your mortgage? Um, about $150,000, probably. $150,000? Yeah. You told me about that bad business deal you made in your hurt. So I'm going to pay off the mortgage. <laughs> Boss. You want me to be your wingman? <laughs> I want this job. He's paying off for a mortgage. Thank you, pardon.
So all three America, um, it's a it's a it's a whole new uh, it's a whole new approach to developing for the company. Can you just give us a little bit about the rationale? Why turn Studio Lambert out of America in a brand sense, and all three America in? All three Media America is the result of a rethink about what we should be doing as a group. Um, if we look at the way in which all the groups, the big super groups that have been created over the last 10, 15 years or so, each of them have tried to come up with different ways of, 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 of bringing together companies that they've acquired and the kind of creative people that are in those companies uh, and having the benefit of scale, but also having the benefit of that creativity. And the fact is that, on the whole, most creatives don't like being part of big um, bureaucratic organizations. And so all three itself, when it started, it had a very original approach. It pioneered, really, what it, we might call the, the, the federal model, um, highly devolved. The companies in the group essentially get on acting as their own businesses. There's a, there's a very, very small center. And to a large extent, the companies operate individually. Hitherto, the plan had been let all those companies go and set up in America. That seemed quite a risky approach. We'd been lucky with Studio Lambert USA as a startup in America because we'd happened to get a big show away very quickly with CBS that underpinned the whole business. But to think that that was replicable was actually quite a risky plan. And so thinking about it, we said, how can we come up with a way that combines what's special about all three, which is that federal model, that, that diversity of creativity. It's a very diverse approach. But at the same time, have the, the, the benefit of big production scale, one single production scale. And all three media in America is that attempt. So we're, we're, we're still encouraging all the companies to have their own operations based inside all three media America's building. Um, they have their own relationships with the buyers. They have obviously a direct relationship with their mother companies, wherever they are, whether they're Britain or Germany or New Zealand or wherever in the group. Um, but once they sell a show, there's one entity that makes those shows, and that's all three Media America, the formerly Studio Lambert US. All those people that were previously employed by Studio Lambert US are now all three Media America employees. And the ambition of all three Media America is to be a first-class production base in both non-scripted but also in scripted. We've just hired our first scripted executive, and the idea is that we will bring the formats of the scripted formats of the group to America, as well as doing um, you know homegrown development for the U.S. scripted market. Okay, so I'd like to come back to how that's going to work in a second, but how did you get that first show away? Because it, it not only got away, it got away just after the Super Bowl, I think. So you you sort of launched with a, a, a flourish. How, how, tell us about that experience. Well, I always make a rule that the first format you do in America when you set up a new company, launch it after the Super Bowl. Um, Sim <laughs> we got very lucky. Um, what, what, what I think is interesting is that model of creating shows in Britain, obviously ever since the terms of, tr terms of trade changed in Britain in the mid-2000s, it meant that we as British producers had a fantastic advantage. Uh, we, we could sell our shows, our paper ideas in, in Britain. And for all kinds of historical reasons, Britain has, is a fantastic place to sell a paper idea. The buyers there prefer to buy a paper idea when, than one that's already been created elsewhere in the world. That's very unusual. Um, but because of the terms of trade change, it meant that we own those shows, we control the distribution, we get the lion's share of the back end. It's been a transformation for, for, the, for the British independent sector. It's what's led to the consolidation. Uh, and historically, what we tended to do was to make those shows in Britain, and then once they had performed well in Britain, we'd go and talk to America. That process is crunching down so fast, it's unbelievable. I mean, uh, we no longer... It's, it, it, with, in the case of Undercover Boss, we shot the British first episode... We didn't bother to wait to edit it. We just, the first thing we did after we shot the episode was to go and cut the pitch tape to take to America. It means you've got two chances, really, because you, you pitch it as soon as you've got tape. If you, for some reason, don't manage to sell it, then you wait for it to go out in, America, in the UK, and then you, if it's a hit, you've got a second attempt to try and sell it. Um, these days, it's getting even tighter. We're, we're currently making a show that we're launching at this market called Inside Job, we're making that for the BBC, but we've also already sold it and have just finished producing 
the pilot for a, a, a large US cable company. Uh, and there we actually just use the pitch materials that we use to sell it to the BBC. So the, that, that, that business of waiting. Anyway, in the case of Undercover Boss, we made that tape. We got lucky and had a chance to pitch it to uh, Nina Tassler, the big boss of CBS Entertainment. She seemed actually to be moved by it. She, was that, there, what, there was a was, tiny was that little, what did it? Uh, absolutely. I mean, the, the challenge is always to get to the people who are actually going to make the decision. Um, even in everywhere in the world, the top people at the networks, whether it's in Britain or the UK or wherever, in the States or wherever, ultimately they're the ones that, that are going to make the decision. On the whole, you normally don't get a chance to pitch the top, top person. It just so happened that for certain reasons, we were able to do that. Nina loved it, and she commissioned a pilot straight away. The pilot we delivered, they tested it as they test everything. The results were so good, they said, that can't be right, go back and test it again. They were even better the second time. And as a result, they ordered the series. We thought, great, we're on air, but we'll probably go out in the summer, like most new reality shows go out in the summer. Most of them, as a result, don't work because it's very hard to get noticed in the summer. And then just before Christmas 2009, I got a call to say, we found a slot. It's quite a good slot. <laughs> <laughs> it's uh, immediately after the Super Bowl in February. Um, and I just said, well, I hope you don't expect us to build on our inheritance. So um, that's obviously helped you establish your company and prove that you could do the job properly. And now you are proving that on behalf of a number of companies within the All3 group. And you know, we, we understand the federal model and how that independence gives people some, some real autonomy. Um, what, what problems are you going to have talking to all of those companies and being their production unit in the US? Do you, do you sense any strain on the, on the free model of All3 uh, because you're going to be the guys producing now, or how are you going to deal with that? With tact and diplomacy. Um, I, I don't think so. I think initially people thought, oh, this is a change. Why do we have to work with these people? But the way in which we've constructed it, um, I think is very, very favorable for everybody. People have, um, it means that the companies in the group are avoiding the enormous risk of starting up in the States. And it is a very difficult place to operate if you're not used to it. Um, it's, for, for a start, there's no standard terms of trade, which means if you're a startup, you get screwed uh, on the whole because they don't know who you are, and they obviously, if they like your idea sufficiently that they want to buy it, they think, well, I can get any deal I want. And actually, the process of operating in the States is a process of building up precedent with, with different buyers. So, if they're working with all three Media America, they're able to immediately come and use the deal that we've got with those particular buyers. Mm. Uh, secondly, we've got an extensive relationship with the community, whether it's the buyers or the people actually make the shows, the, the, the freelance people you have to bring on board. If you don't know all those people, it's really, really difficult. Mm. Um, so I think that the sell is, and the way in which we've arranged the finance, the, 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 the economics of it, it's actually very, very favorable for the companies in the group to work with us, so. Can you give us a hint of how that works? And are there a couple of product, uh, projects that are archetypally gonna be the first that come through you from other companies in the group that you can tell us about? Um, how that works is essentially that it, 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 it works in such a way that the companies operating with all three Media America get such a good deal that it's almost the same as if they were pretty much the same as if they were operating it as their own They've standalone the company, themselves. which is great. Um, we're talking to, the, to, to people in the group about all kinds of shows that, that they have already in production. I mean, obviously, examples, uh, we're working with, 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 with Lime on a US version of TOWIE. Uh, we are working with Objective on a number of shows that they have um, already on, on, on television in the UK. Uh, Maverick had already employed somebody who's now working with all three Media America, and we're, that's, that's largely currently um, specific development for the US. I mean, the, the benefit of these, for these companies is not simply that they get to send their formats to all three Media America and have their person working in America on their formats. They also employ their own people who are going to do US development. So, uh, you know. US cable television is primarily driven at the moment, non-scripted, by DocuSoap. So it's actually quite difficult to get formats across. The biggest buyers for formats in the US 
other uh, other broadcast networks. So the big the big fish are actually the ones that you're going that you're going for. Yes, but again, of course, not every format that works on British television is necessarily going to work um, for, a, for, for, for a US broadcast network. I mean, a lot of British formats tend to be built, built around on-screen talent uh, and often are very specific to the British taste and trying to find the American equivalent. Sometimes, obviously, I mean, there have been many examples of U UK talent, on-screen talent, going and ending up presenting... Uh, the, the, the American versions of the shows, but that's difficult. I mean, they have to be in two places at once if they're going to carry on doing those shows. Clearly, there are examples of it, but it's, it's, it's tough. Let's just go back to the, to the beginning, just briefly, to get an overall picture of how you have developed uh, uh, through, throughout your career and if there are any rules that apply across that development. Um, I mean, could, could you give us like a, a whistle-stop two-minute tour of how you got the job at uh, the BBC, how you went to RDF, how you left RDF, and what all of those programmes and, and experiences along the way, how, how they've informed the, the decisions you make nowadays. It's a small question. <laughs> okay, my life story in two minutes. Two minutes. Um, I knew I wanted to work in television when I left university. I didn't know how to go about it, so I got a grant to do a PhD and thought in politics, and I thought, I'll write about the politics of television. It so happened that somebody who was running the British Film Institute at the time said, oh, we're looking for somebody to write a book about how Channel 4 came about, because Channel 4 was about to start in a year's time, so he commissioned me to write this book, which was a fascinating way of learning about the television industry. On the back of that, I got rather unusually got a job working for the BBC Secretariat, uh, thinking, if I can get into the BBC, I'll be able to get other jobs. Within three months, I managed to move across to the documentaries department, where I stayed for the next 16 years, making documentaries all around the world, until eventually they said, you need to be an executive, you can't keep doing all that stuff. And actually, my wife was quite keen for me not to be away all the time. So I became an executive and started a strand called Modern Times, which was the main documentary strand on BBC Two in the 90s. And it was the home of authorship. That was what we were trying to do, find people who were great filmmakers and give them the opportunity to find their voice. And uh, in those days, it was remarkable. People could pitch an idea to me, and I could commission it in the room. I don't think that exists anymore in the BBC. Um, and that worked very well, and it also did a number of docu-soaps and various other series. I commissioned, towards the end of my time, a company called RDF. It was a relatively small company that David Frank had started, and David and I got on very well. Quite a few of my colleagues in the BBC were beginning to leave and set up independent production companies. David said, why don't you come and be the creative head of RDF? And that was in 1998. Uh, no, it wasn't. It was in, yes, 1998, which I then did. And the challenge was how to use all those documentary skills and turn that into commercial television, because... Obviously, documentaries might be great if you're in the BBC and that's what you're focused on, but if you're trying to run an independent production company, you need to have something that returns. And so the challenge was come up with documentary formats. There weren't a lot of documentary formats around in those days. Um, and the first one, as you mentioned, was Faking It, um, which was a great success, much loved. It was a difficult show to make a lot of episodes because each time we went into a different world and eventually we ran out of of worlds. Our big mistake was not realizing that most of those worlds, I mean, we did one, for instance, on somebody faking it as a ballroom dancer. I never thought that that would be quite a good idea. <laughs> we did one on somebody faking it as a top chef and used some relatively unknown cook called Gordon Ramsay as the mentor. I never thought about that would be a good person to do a show with. So anyway, faking it was the first that, that, that worked and was much loved. But the real thing that took turned everything around was Wife Swap, um, which was the first show that we were able to take to a, an American broadcast network. We got it away on ABC, and hundreds of episodes have been made there and, 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 all, uh, and many other places. Um, and then in 2000 and... whenever it was, 2008, started Studio Lambert and was very attracted to the all-three media model because I wanted that support of a big super indie, but at the same time, I wanted the autonomy for Studio Lambert to be its own entity. I also wanted to set up in America, having learned a lot about operating in America at RDF. Um, and um, the other people that I was talking to wanted me to work with their American operation, whereas um, 
all three were keen for Studio Lambert to start up in America. It seems to me that faking it, wife swap, and undercover boss all have a sort of a character, that's probably the character of your experience of, of, of documentary and factual development that enhances the, the depth of, of, of those projects. But do you work in a particular way when you're developing an idea? I mean, do you have a particular graph, a particular chart, a Venn diagram? Where, how do you generate the ideas in the first place? It's really hard. Um, I've never settled on a particular way of coming up with ideas or running development. Um, in, in the time I've been involved in coming up with television program ideas, I've had situations where we've had an enormous development team. I've had situations where it's been quite small. I've had times when we've done regular weekly brainstorms. I've done other times when it's been more organic and casual. There, I don't think there is a, an answer. Uh, what I do know is that when I fall in love with an idea, then I usually feel confident I can persuade somebody to buy it, but it's not often that you fall in love with an idea. And I think you have to suddenly think, oh gosh, yes, I can see there's a beginning, middle, and end here, that people will be in a different place when they get to the end of it, the characters, that there is... The hard thing about any format is how do you ensure consistency, I mean, all formats, essentially, that's what a format is. It's saying, this is how you make it. it. It's always this. But at the same time, it can't always be this in the sense that it can't always be identical. And finding something that is not always identical, that gives you variety, but at the same time sticks within the constraints of the format is really hard. A lot of what I've done has been about class. You know, it's, it's putting people in a, or, or, or not necessarily class, but values. I very often come, I get excited by ideas where I put, we put people in a situation that challenges their values and they, they, they learn from that or they, they react to it. Uh, and that can be both comedic and dramatic. Um, it's, it's often very hard to know why you feel that an idea is right. But what I have been very lucky about is that many of the most successful shows I've been involved in I was able to find a buyer who was willing to take a risk and let us make the first episode without spending an enormous amount of time trying to work it out in detail. It's my belief that very often the best formats get sorted out when you're actually making it, and the crucial element to all this is therefore making, having the relationships with people that are great practitioners of making your programs, you know, from the, from, the, from the producer directors to the cameramen to the editors to the support staff to everybody that's involved. If you haven't got the right people, you won't execute the idea well the first time. You, you won't execute it well the, the hundredth time either, but it's the first time that's the most crucial. Uh, and I've been lucky that, that, that people, the buyers who have bought our ideas, have very often let us work it out in detail. I mean, in WiveSwap, for instance, we sold that as a personal finance program. We had been taken by the idea of those uh, features that you get in the British papers, that, like the Daily Mail in female, and we saw, one, they regularly do this kind of thing, that this is what a nurse earns, this is how she spends her money, this is what a barrister earns, and this is how she spends her money. And we thought, wouldn't it be interesting if they lived on each other's money, and they sort of lived each other's lives, and joked about, well, they couldn't go and live in each other's bedrooms. Well, no, but they can do everything else, and, and it's a wife swap. Um, and it was only when we started making the first episode that we realized it was much bigger than that. It was about values. But crucially, also, we didn't know until we started making it all the kind of details, like there needs to be a manual that articulates the values and the practices of these homes. Because if you didn't have the manuals, it would take too long for the two visiting wives to, to understand each other's world and react to each other's world. And the idea of them coming in, reading that on their own, looking around the house on their own, so that by the time they meet their new families, they've got lots and lots of strong feelings about them already. All that kind of detail only came when we started making the first episode. Um, and that's a luxury that uh, I really treasure, because I think one of the things that kills ideas is that they get overdeveloped on paper before you get the chance to start making it. And that, as we all know, the, 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 the committee designing the horse ends up with the camel. And I think there's a lot of camels on television. You've made lots of good decisions. Um, what, what have been the bad decisions that you've made? Do you look back on certain shows and think, oh, God, I really wish I hadn't done that? Or, you know... Yes, I've got very good amnesia. <laughs> um, 
I mean, you know, I think, I think the difficult time, there are times when you are making, it's nearly always because you're, you, you, you decide to make a show that you don't fully believe in, and then um, you think, oh, well, maybe we'll be able to sort this out, and in a way contrary to what I was saying a minute ago, um, sometimes if you haven't worked an idea out enough and you start making it and you realize, well, it actually wasn't that good an idea. Um, and I think there's no doubt that if the, the, the challenge of running any business is that you need, you, know, you need the work to come in or otherwise you're going to have to start reducing your overheads and nobody likes doing that. And so sometimes you do take on things but that, 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 that ultimately aren't that great. But um, I think our record of picking shows that we do believe in and making them work is at least as good as anybody else's. What's the most ridiculous format idea you've ever had pitched? Mm. Or heard of being <laughs> pitched? <laughs> well, I, the, 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 the show that I'm most excited about that's on there at the moment for us, which is a show that we've just finished making for Channel 4 called Gogglebox, when that was first suggested, I said, what a stupid idea that was. Um, and a lot of people when they heard about the idea, particularly on Twitter, before they saw it, they thought it was the end of Western civilization that Channel 4 was making a program about people watching television. What a stupid idea. Um, it turns out to be a brilliant idea. Uh, I, I, I think it is. And certainly the feedback we've had from people who've watched it um, think it's, it's very funny. Um, it... it, it, it it all hangs on the execution. It's all about, I mean, our, our shows, all shows depend on casting and finding the right characters because for, 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 for non-scripted reality shows, for non-scripted format shows, your cast are your writers. They are the people who are going to say the words that you know, will make your show work. And although you can throw away all those words that are bad that they say, they have to say some good words as well. And um, sometimes the format is very strong and you can sort of get away with a relatively weak cast, but something like Gogglebox hangs entirely on finding a cast of characters who are a cross-section of, of Britain, uh, or at least they reflect some of the geographical and, 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 and uh, class variety of Britain. And they watch television, the programmes of the week, so it's a fast turnaround show. You haven't got any time to, to, to sort of ponder in the edit. Um, and it's very funny, I think. It's like the local, it's, it seems what, that what's happening is that, that there's a lot of uh, celebrity or talent fronted formats that are all very working very well in their domestic markets. Uh, but isn't that a sort of a barrier to those things traveling? Because you are now relying on the cast rather than the format, as you've, as you've said in this instance. And that, that happens US side and. Uh, yes, but, 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 but the, that particular example of Gogglebox, obviously you could make that all over the world because you can go and find your cast for that program in that territory. Mm -hmm. What we were talking about That's earlier is, 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 is the fact that a lot of British formats are, driv are built around um, you know, very, very strong on-screen British talent. Mm -hmm. um, and that's the hard thing. I mean, it does exist. You know, look at Gordon Ramsay. He's in both countries. I mean, somehow he's cloned himself. He seems to be there everywhere. Um, so it is possible, but it's, it's challenging if, 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 your show, if your idea is all about the, 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 the talent. Because... I think actually the, it's harder to find um, the equivalent talent, American talent, to lots of British talent. We have so many more titles, we have so many more shows that are built around on screen talent, I think, than, I don't know, maybe that's an unfair generalisation, but anyway. I'll do. <laughs> I think it's perhaps time for some questions. Um, does anybody have a question? Could we put the lights up and um, there's one right down the front, if we could have a microphone down here. If anyone else has a question, put your hand up and let me know who to come to next. If you could let us know who you are and where you come from. Hello, uh, Stuart Dredge from MIP Blog and The Guardian. Um, your shows generate a lot of social media chatter naturally. People are watching and tweeting and Facebooking. But how much do you think creatively about second screen, social media, digital stuff, apps, when you're thinking of formats and programmes? Mm. When you have an idea that you realize has great potential in terms of second screen, uh, then you get very excited about that and put a lot of effort into trying to work out how to do that well. Um, 
but it's not a requirement to have that because that would be too limiting. Um, and, um, but right now we're developing a show that we hope will get ordered at the end of this week. And it has a very big second screen element. And that's tr terrifically exciting to have that. Um, but equally, lots of other programs don't have it. The ability to get the focus group that is the Twitter community, particularly as that community grows, or Facebook, but particularly Twitter because it's so instant, is, is a wonderful tool for producers. I mean, we used to look at filmmakers or theatre producers and think how lucky for them. They could go to an audience, a theatre or a cinema, and they could actually feel, and feel in touch with their audience. In the old days, we would get a few cranky letters and, and, and probably a spurious number that was the audience number, and that was it. Uh, now, we have this direct relationship where you, you, you as your programs go out, you're getting a second-by-second you know, second feedback. I mean, obviously, the danger is the Twitter, um, the people on Twitter are not equal to the whole audience, and you mustn't think, oh, everybody's thinking this way. But it is a, it's, it's quite a revolution. Isn't, isn't it the case as well that with social media that you, get, you do get a certain type of person, particularly on Twitter, and it's normally negativity driven? Do you feel that? Or do you feel that there's a, a, as much positive uh, contact through, through Twitter as, uh, as criticism? And, and how do you balance that and, or listen to it? I've got this thing on my Twitter where I can delete all negative stuff without having to see it. <laughs> nice. Can I have one? <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, if, if, if people don't like a show and they tell you on Twitter, then that's important to know. I, I, I mean, yeah, we've also had shows where people are very positive about it. Um, uh, I don't think... I mean, I think it's more in terms of the age or the kind of... Um, the age and maybe the... The, the... the Twitter audience doesn't represent the full age range of the audience. But then, of course... Uh, the, 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 the broadcasters tend to be more interested in the younger audience anyway. So, mm. And you, you not, can't really get away with announcing a show that's about to get picked up that's going to be uh, cross platforms and uh, revolutionary without telling us more about it. What's, what's going on there then? Uh, well, I mean, we've been developing a show for quite a few weeks, or months even, um, that we are hoping to get good news on this week. Um, I'm rushing back to America to do the final run-through. Okay. Um, and it's, it's a hybrid. And I think that, in a way, one of the things that the, the future holds is all the time finding more hybrids. It's a hybrid between a reality show and a, 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 a sort of quiz game show. And I think that... Um, I think that finding hybrids are what... I mean... Not, it goes without saying, so, you know, the, 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 um, the, the whole blurring between scripted and non-scripted, um, the um, trying to find ways of doing comedy that's also non-scripted. I mean, what, what's been exciting about Gogglebox is the reaction from lots of people say, this is a very funny show, and yet you're not expected to be funny as a factual program. Um, so... You know, we often make factual or formatted factual shows that have a bit of humour in them, but they're not the, the, the primary purpose of them is not to make you laugh. With the, what was exciting about Gogglebox was that its, its primary purpose actually is to make you laugh. Um, okay. Is there, are there any more questions out there? There's a, thing, there's a question. Yep. Yeah, if you could uh, let us know who you are. I've never seen you before. I'm, uh, I'm Jonathan Webdale from C21. Oh, right. um, <laughs> I, I was just wondering, Stephen, um, you've probably seen that Simon Cowell, sort of sticking on the digital theme, has, uh, has, has recently launched his latest um, format via YouTube. I was wondering if that's, if you were aware of it and what you thought of it and whether that was something that you were interested in as well or are you sticking with the broadcast networks? Um... We are currently sticking with the broadcast networks. Not, not to say that as a group, all three is active in uh, YouTube channels and has a number of YouTube tube channels. But my primary interest is dealing with the, um, the, 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 the traditional 
uh, uh, broadcast and cable buyers around the world. There's a lot of them. There's a lot of business to be won from them. Um, I think, obviously, using YouTube and other things as a way of telling people about your shows or giving them, uh, giving them a flavor or getting them excited about your show before you go on air it becomes ever more part of the equation. Um, certainly this show that I'm being a little, uh, sort of vague about will have a big element of that. There will be, it will be launched on, on, on social media long before it first appears uh, on, on, on television. What's the biggest threat to your business, do you think, um, uh, over the coming 12 months? And um, how are you going to overcome it to make sure that all three media, uh, all three media America, in particular, I imagine, is, it, it succeeds? Mm, I don't know. Um, biggest threat, not having enough good ideas that we convince people to buy. Um, are, the, are the broadcasters hungry for content at the moment? And if so, yes, do they know what they want? Yes, I think they're hugely hungry for content. I mean, I think that's what feels so exciting, particularly in America. There's more original programming being commissioned than ever before, both in non-scripted and scripted. You have an exciting situation where uh, 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 a number of cable networks that previously were only scripted are now starting to do non-scripted. We make the pitch for AMC, which was a a cable network that previously only did scripted. Um, and you have a, quite a large number of non-scripted cable networks uh, starting to do scripted. Um, so I think the ability to get a new program ideas away is greater than ever. I think that's great news for producers. It's also bad news for producers. The bad news is it's much harder to get those new shows to work uh, in the sense of being noticed by this very big audience that's looking for whatever will hold their attention. And uh, I find that the challenge of getting the second series order feels almost greater these days than getting the first series order. Um, and, and, and interestingly, if you talk to some of the people running cable networks in America, they are all quite honest about this. They, they, they no longer think that their big marketing push should be on new shows in their first series. They tend to put them out, and if the audience finds them, then they go very big in the second series. Right. Um, the, 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 they don't want to waste their limited marketing firepower on a whole lot of new shows that they've got no idea whether the audience will like. So that might seem to play to Jonathan's point about the surrounding media yeah, being, being very Absolutely, and trying important. to find ways of doing that. Um, you know, trying, try, trying to get social media to get excited about you. There are lots of different sort of thoughts about that. But it is very hard. The most astonishing figure, I think, is that in America, on the broadcast networks, who primarily launch their non-scripted shows in the summer, all four of the big networks um, in the last three years, every single non-scripted show they've launched in the summer hasn't come back, apart from, I think, um, Hotel Hell, the... Um, Gordon Ramsay sort of show that's a bit like Kitchen Nightmares, but in hotels. Um, it, every single other, and we're talking about you know four or five new shows on each network for the last three years. It's tough. It's not. What? Why is that? What? Why can't it work? What? It, too many channels? Not not good enough ideas? Fragmented audience? <laughs> yes. <laughs> All and there's a lot of existing. I mean, clearly there are a lot of. Uh, non-scripted shows on the broadcast networks in America in the summer that are returning and that have been established. And I think it's just quite hard to get the audience to come to the new ones. Of, of all the shows out there that you haven't created, which one do you wish you had? Oh, American Idol. <laughs> purely, purely for financial gain. <laughs> no, I'm, uh, well, lots of them. I don't know. Um, I mentioned the fact that we did a faking it about ballroom dancing. I kicked myself. We didn't come up with um, Strictly or... And what, do you, what, what haven't you achieved yet that you would like to? What, what's the next big thing for you? Well, I would love to continue doing what I mostly have done, which is the sort of documentary format, the format that's in the sort of factual entertainment world, as people refer to it in Britain, although nobody knows what you're talking about when you say factual entertainment in America. Um, but I would also love to be involved in in something that feels like a very big, pure entertainment show. And fingers crossed it goes well this week. We'll find out more. Before we say goodbye to Stephen, uh, every year um, 
we give out an award, uh, C21 and Frapper, in association with MIP Formats. Uh, we call it the C21 Frapper Gold Award, and it's for contribution to the business. And as luck would have it, uh, we're going to give that award to Stephen uh, now. So please sit tight. This will only take a few minutes, then we can all go and have a drink on the beach. Hope I'm, we're not going to embarrass you, but I'd like to invite uh, Laureen Garrow uh, and the Frapper Board onto the stage just to say a few words uh, about the award. And Patsy Janest, who's the chairperson of FRAPA. Sorry, Patsy. <laughs> go ahead. How elegant we are, aren't we? Um, dear Stephen. Yeah, why don't let's go and let's go and shake on. hands, shall we? Don't be shy. <laughs> <laughs> Personally, I love your format. Thank you. Even the trailer brought a tear in my eye. How brilliant is that, really, honestly? So, um, the way you structure the storytelling in documentary style f uh, programming, which is now called factual entertainment formats, um, you're one of the key persons who, brought, who actually brought us to that particular factual entertainment formats category, I think. So, it wasn't a lot of thinking for all of us here um, that you should be the next award winner of the C21 Frappa Gold Award. So it's the 10th year, actually. Your name will be in the list of uh, Reg Grundy, who was the first one in 2003. And there's a couple of others like Stephen Leahy, Trish Kinane, uh, David Lyle, of course, uh, Peter Bezelgat. Dick de Rijk. Um, Dick de Rijk. And, well, here you are now. Or isn't that fantastic? I hope you like it, receiving this award. I'm not sure if it's your first award ever. Maybe <laughs> with one of your fa factual entertainment formats, you did with all three, of course, uh, and well-deserved. So congratulations on behalf of the Frappa board. Can we have a picture? Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Should we Thank just get a, a quick picture before we... Uh, sure. Gather in, sure. gather in, gather in. Gather in. Great. Do you want to say a few words? Just a... Oh, is it working? Here. Yeah. Hello? Just kill the music, please. Hello? <laughs> hello, hello, hello? No, no. Yeah, you're on. I don't think so. Oh, yes. Uh, thank you so much. It's a great pleasure to receive this, and that's a very um, illustrious bunch of people, of reprobates, uh, to be accompanying uh, as, as also receivers of this award. Uh, I'd just like to thank... Um, all those people that have um, helped make all these shows work. Um, there, there are many of them, but um, here tonight is uh, Joe Crawley, who's worked with me at the BBC and at RDF and at uh, Studio Lambert. Um, and I'd obviously like to thank um, people from all three media, uh, Steve Morrison, who supported uh, Studio Lambert when we started, and uh, Louise and her team from all three media international have done such a brilliant job in getting our shows to be out there around the world. So thank you very much, and thank you, David, for Thank you, talking. and thank you all for coming. Uh, so now we'll go and have a drink down the beach. Thank you. Thank you, Stephen.